Well, good morning and welcome to our Mortgage Quality and Compliance webinar. This is Susan Malazzo with the California MBA and I'm glad that you could join us. So if you are a regular subscriber to uh, our MQAC webinars, you'll know that we are off schedule today. Um, we typically have this on the fourth Thursday of the month. Um, that conflicted with uh, one of our virtual conferences, our Western Secondary Market Conference uh, in September. So we moved this, um, this topic to today. So thank you for, um, for accommodating that change. We do have one more uh, webinar before the, um, that will close out the year, and that will be on October 22nd. And we'll note that at the end of today's presentation. Uh, one thing I wanted to draw your attention to was uh, in the chat fun in the chat box. I have um, shared with you a link for our Legal Issues and Regulatory Compliance Conference that will be happening virtually December seventh and eighth. And that link will um, allow you to uh, register for the event or look at sponsorship opportunities. So invite you to uh, to join us um, for our regular conference. Unfortunately, we can't be in person, but we do have some great content lined up uh, for our virtual event. We've, uh, we've done three such events over the summer. We've had great success with them, fantastic feedback. So we definitely have been able to pivot to the virtual world and offer um, you know, meaningful and in, you know, information and networking uh, opportunities through our virtual conferences. So looking forward to that in December. We're gonna kick off today's uh, presentation with a legislative update from our lobbyist, Pat Zenzla. We've got, we're at the end of, uh, we're past the end of session, but he's going to talk about uh, a few measures that um, were of significant importance um, as we closed out this uh, crazy legislative session in 2020. So Pat, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Susan. Um, yes, we're, I think, all happy to see the closing of the legislative session uh, this year. Um, it was uh, quite an interesting session with uh, the COVID impact and um, having to work essentially um, uh, uh, you know, away from the actual physical building and not be able to meet directly with members face to face, um, having to do everything virtually. So um, the, I think the main three bills I want to talk about today um, have a, would have an impact on uh, the California MBA membership and were of great interest during uh, the session. So the first one I want to uh, reference is AB 1864. This is really the governor's proposal um, to reorganize the Department of Business Oversight into the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, and also to establish the California Consumer Financial Protection Law. The stated purpose of this uh, proposal really is to go after um, unlicensed or unregistered entities um, offering financial service uh, financial services and financial products to consumers in California basically to combat um, what's been described as a, a potential unfair deceptive or abusive practices basically this sets up a, a mini CFPB at the state level in California one of the major concerns that our membership had is that as it was originally proposed it would have overlaid, um, you know, new requirements and new liability on existing licensee structures, um, uh, whether it's the residential mortgage lending or uh, CFL or even uh, under the Department of Real Estate. The good news is we were able to get an exemption for, for CFLs and RMLAs and also exemptions for other existing licensees, uh, including state chartered banks, federally chartered banks, et cetera. So basically other licensed entities um, would no longer have additional requirements under the uh, act, the new act, which was signed into law by the governor. Then another key thing was um, there was potentially a great deal of liability under the new act um, as far as the department's ability to go after, you know, what it considered to be abusive practices in addition to all of the existing enforcement opportunities and penalties under existing law. 
And there's a section in there that we were successful in obtaining that says nothing um, in you know the enforcement section of the bill either expands or limits the authority of um, federal section 5552 of Dodd-Frank. So basically leaving everything as is with respect to enforcement, et cetera, for existing licensees. So that was, those were very positive amendments. And once again, the bill has um, been signed into law and it is operative on uh, January 1st. The next bill I wanted to mention is AB 3088. This is one of several bills basically that are COVID related that uh, intended to provide either uh, tenant rent relief and or mortgage uh, assistance, uh, forbearance, et cetera. Um, so this bill was um, essentially a product of compromise. We were uh, able to work with the various policymakers to um, develop compromise language that did not have a draconian impact on uh, the mortgage marketplace, um, but yet uh, provided relief uh, for consumers, borrowers with respect to uh, residential mortgages. Um, some of the key provisions, um, it would provide HOBAR protections for residential one to four properties occupied by rental tenants. Um, uh, up until this passage of this bill, um, uh, HOBAR protections did not apply in uh, rental situations. Also, if a mortgage servicer denies forbearance request from a consumer um, uh, made during the effective date, so the operational date of the bill would be um, April 1st up to uh, April 1st, uh, 2021, um, the, a servicer must provide written notice to the borrower explaining the, the reason the forbearance was not provided. If there was a curable defect in the borrower's forbearance request, the servicer would then need to identify that defect and allow for 21 days for the borrower to cure the defect. And then also, um, if forbearance is denied, the servicer must include a declaration um, required by Section 2923.5 as to whether forbearance was uh, or was not uh, required. Um, uh, Importantly, there is a safe harbor from these requirements for both federally backed and non-federally backed mortgages if the servicer complies with the relevant CARES Act provisions. So that's a very positive uh, amendment in that bill. Uh, and then the final bill I want to mention is SB 1079. This is a bill that the California MBA did oppose. And under the bill until January 1st, 2026, it would basically set up an alternative process in connection with the trustee sale uh, as far as non-judicial foreclosure and, and judicial foreclosure. Um, under the power of sale um, for residential one to four units, um, this new process would allow specified persons basically um, individuals that say they're going to be owner occupants and other eligible builders, uh, tenant buyers, nonprofit associations, et cetera. There's a long list of potential eligible bidders. They would be able to notify the trustee within 15 days that they're interested in making a bid. This is after the actual sale, uh, normal sale uh, with respect to non judicial foreclosures. And then they would have um, a a total of 45 day time frame after that um, initial sale in foreclosure to uh, finalize the bid. Um, and so basically what this does is it creates this kind of uh, new 45 day period where the original um, successful bidder is on hold while you have additional bidders um, being able to essentially bid a dollar more than the original winning bid and be able to um, uh, uh, get the property. So the, the intent was to try to stop uh, or at least um, uh, help uh, protect against these corporate entities that would purchase large amounts of residential one to four properties and then um, rent them out versus having owner occupied uh, individuals. It does other things, including increase some of the penalties if you don't maintain a property um, after purchasing in, in uh, non-judicial foreclosure. So those are kind of the key provisions. Once again, this bill would take effect January 1st of 2021. And that's it, Susan, as far as the bills I wanted to briefly reference today. God, thank you. Thanks so much, Pat. Uh, this has definitely been a um, 
a very difficult legislative session and uh you know as always want to thank you for your diligent work to represent the real estate finance industry in california i know that even though we're on legislative recess that there is a lot of discussion about what's going to be um, introduced in the new year so um a bit of a breather but we're kind of also bracing for another um another full year in 2021 so thank you pat for everything that you do for us we appreciate it thank you susan okay well we're moving on to our legal issues update uh and i'd like to welcome michael pfeiffer with um kirby mcguinn michael is uh our general counsel for the california mba and here today to give you some information on um, this uh, this court case. So, Michael, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, if you go to the next slide, Susan, I'll get into this. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a basic, basically a consent order uh, entered with the CFPB involving uh, mortgage company called in ray clear path well clear path lending is the mortgage company the case is in ray clear path lending there are a number of cases and uh in this particular one um the cfpb issued a consent order against clear path lending uh, which which basically had been licensed as a broker and a lender in about 22 states and offered us mortgage loans uh, va loans essentially and uh their means of advertising was direct mail campaigns, and uh, this one is about advertising, and, and I indicated related cases, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, but basically, the CFPB did an audit and found that they had sent consumers uh, mailers for VA guaranteed mortgages that contained false and misleading and inaccurate statements uh, and that lacked required disclosures. And they basically accused them of uh, violating the Consumer Financial Protection Act under Dodd-Frank, uh, the prohibitions of dis against deceptive uh, uh, practices, and uh, also the Mortgage Acts and Practices Advertising Rule and Regulation Z. Um, they are required to pay a civil money penalty of $625,000 for these violations, and there were additional uh, uh, restrictions imposed on them, which I'll talk about in a second. So this is just kind of a quick overview. Go to the next slide to get into a little bit more detail. Um, I mentioned related cases. This one is the eighth case stemming from a CFPB sweep of investigations of mortgage companies uh, who are alleged to have used deceptive mailers to advertise VA guaranteed mortgages. They, over the last several months, they have gone after uh, seven other companies. And this is the eighth one, and those are all published, and I'll give you the sites to them all. So this is, you can see, the, this, this case illustrates a couple things. Number one, it is designed to basically scream in your ears about uh, advertising violations, number one. Number two, it also reveals sort of the latest tactic of the CFPB, which is to uh, pursue these sweeps, where they go after uh, a series of companies uh, to try to illustrate a particular emphasis of uh, enforcement activity. In this particular case, uh, and the other cases are all very similar, so I'm not going to talk about all other seven cases, but I will give you sites to them. But in this particular case, they misrepresented the credit terms of the mortgage loan by stating terms that they were not actually prepared to offer, including misrepresenting the APR. Those things usually go together. That's why the APR is so important um, in advertising, because it, if you don't get the APR right, chances are, well, if you're if you're misrepresenting other things, then the APR is not going to be right. So they they sort of tagged them on three different levels here. Um, they also misrepresent the rates or the payments as fixed, even though um, the actual mortgage was an adjustable rate. That one is kind of hard to fathom that they would actually go to do that. That's pretty bold to advertise an adjustable rate mortgage as a fixed rate mortgage, but apparently that's what they were doing here. Um, there's some kind of a hint from this in that the payment was not fixed for the indicated duration. So there was a lot of misrepresentation going on uh, regarding whether this was a fixed or adjustable rate mortgage. They also misrepresented the uh, existence, nature, or amount in different advertisements of the cash or credit available to the consumer, a typical cash out refi, or the existence or amount of fees or costs to the consumer. 
And um, so they maybe have been saying that it's cash out on this VA loans. Uh, they may have been saying that the amount that of the loan was incorrect. They were also indicating that they were misrepresenting the amount of fees and the cost of the loan. These are all of the sort of classic things that you look for uh, for advertising violations. And, uh, you know, just basic, uh, accurate information was apparently lacking. And, and then to top it off, they uh, apparently uh, created the false impression that they were somehow affiliated with the VA. That one has been around for, I mean, I, as long as I can remember, is that you can't be telling people that you're somehow affiliated with the government and you're, and you're here to help. Um, so those are, those are the violations. Thank you for advancing the slide. They also failed to properly disclose, uh, when required by regula Regulation Z, the credit terms for the mortgage, such as the number and time period of payments associated with their, their repayment obligations over the full term of the loan. What that indicates is that they were essentially, there were a number of trigger terms in the advertisements, and they didn't provide the additional uh, information that uh, Reg Z requires when you have trigger terms, including quoting rates and, and that sort of thing. And so um, that created a secondary level of, of violations. And they finally, they used the, uh, the name of uh, their own name in a misleading way and didn't even disclose uh, their uh, their accurate name and uh, <clears throat> apparently tried to um, uh, fool uh, borrowers into thinking that they were somehow affiliated with the consumer's current lender. So uh, these are, you know, when we review advertising for clients, I mean, we always make sure that we try to, I mean, the, the rules are very clear. You need to have their, the correct name. You need to have their NMLS number, you need to have uh, a license number, typically in California, certainly, you have to have uh, you know, that information, the address, all of that identifying information was apparently lacking on being seen. So they got civil money penalty of $625,000. They got an injunction against future violations. Uh, and these are sort of typical CFPB consent order requirements. They're required to bolster their compliance functions by designating a specific advertising compliance official who's required to review all mortgage advertisements prior to their use. And uh, there's a prohibition on similar misrepresentations uh, in the future. And uh, also various uh, uh, mandates with respect to uh, disclosure requirements to prevent future misrepresentations. So the copy of the consent order is there in that, uh, I've given you the uh, web address to get that copy of that. If you go to the next page, Susan, um, I've listed the other uh, um, entities against whom similar consent orders were issued and the uh, links to their uh, their consent orders. Sovereign Lending Group, Prime Choice Funding, Go Direct Lenders, PH Loans, Hypotech, Service First, and Accelerate. So all of those and in the, on the dates indicated, you can kind of see the pattern uh, where they were going up with all of this. So the notion is, I think that what the, 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 the takeaway from this is that the CFPB is really looking for you to make sure that your advertising, and these are VA related loans, and obviously they prioritize those because of service members. But a lot of the violations were kind of violations that we often see, not just in VA loans, but in conventional loans and, and uh, any other, and other kinds of loans. So that's the key takeaway. Double check your advertising, make sure that you are in compliance because the CFPB is signaling and loud and clear that this is an area that they're going to be looking at when they come to examine you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, no kidding. That is a, a clear uh, a clear indicator there. And uh, we appreciate that information. Very timely considering uh, this month's presentation uh, as well. Um, with that, we'll, uh, I want to... Uh, get us into, and thank you, thank you, Michael, for your, your presentation. I want to get us into uh, this month's featured presentation, which is the CFPB's new interpretation of UDAP. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, Carol Carson, who is the Chief Compliance Officer at Plaza Home Mortgage, and also our current chair for the Mortgage Quality and Compliance Committee. So Carol, I will turn it over to you. Hey, thanks so much, Susan, and and um, good morning, everyone, and welcome welcome to um, this this double feature portion of um, the MQAC uh, committee meeting. 
Our feature presentation today is on um, the CFPB's new approach towards UDAP. And we're very pleased we have um, two ladies who are both um, attorneys with the law firm of Buckley LLP. Both of them work out of the Los Angeles office. Um, we have uh, Lauren Frank. Lauren is an associate who assists clients in regulatory and compliance matters and also provides support for complex litigation and government investigations involving the mortgage industry. Uh, Lauren received her bachelor's from George Mason University and her JD from the University of Southern California. Uh, welcome, Lauren. Uh, the other, our other presenter is Sherry Maria Safchek. Um, Sherry Maria, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, Sherry Maria is counsel uh, with Buckley, and she also represents clients in regulatory and compliance matters, and also uh, works on complex litigation and government investigations uh, involving not only mortgage, but consumer and commercial lending industries. Uh, she is uh, advises clients on privacy issues, especially including the CCPA. Um, Sherry Maria uh, received her bachelor's at the University of Southern California and her JD from George Washington University. So welcome to both of you and um, take it away. Thanks so much, Carol. Uh, this is Lauren. I'm going to kick us off. Um, as she mentioned, we're going to be talking about the CFPB's new interpretation of UDAP. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background on um, UDAP generally uh, and how we sort of got to the point we're at, and then I will turn it over to Sherry to talk about the main event. Um, and I just want to start with the very obvious caveat that this is all for informational purposes and it's not legal advice. So with that said, um, I'm going to move into the background. Uh, so modern UDAP has its origins in the original FTC Act of 1914, which included a prohibition on unfair methods of competition and commerce. And that initial language really focused on antitrust violations, but it was amended in 1938 uh, to uh, incorporate the broader current language, uh, which is a prohibition on unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. Um, and that's enforced predominantly by the FTC. Uh, that sort of laid the groundwork for the quite robust UDAP uh, universe that we now have at both the state and federal levels. Um, and most notably, the, the biggest development we've had certainly in the last couple of decades on UDAP was the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, which created the CFPB and then also enacted, as was mentioned earlier by PACS, um, a broad prohibition not just on uh, unfair deceptive action practices, but abusive action practices. Um, Dodd-Frank is really the first federal law to broadly prohibit abuse of acts and practices in connection with the provision of consumer financial uh, products and services. But there are certainly other federal laws, some of which predate UDAP, that also include sort of more limited scope prohibitions on UDAP, um, such as uh, the FCPA, which prohibits um, certain abuse of acts in the context of debt collection, and uh, the telemarketing sales rule, which, produce, uh, which prohibits certain abusive telemarketing acts and practices. Uh, we also find UDAP laws uh, in the laws of most states. And those prohibitions often take the form of a law that generally prohibits unfair or deceptive trade practices, and then lists uh, certain practices as exemplars that would be considered unfair or deceptive. Um, and then there are a, a few states um, California being the newest addition, that also have UDAP laws that prohibit abusive acts and practices. Um, so that's an example of sort of seeing the changes at the federal level trickle down to the states, um, which is a trend that we often see. So for uh, about three decades following the FTC's enactment of its prohibition on UDAP, there was no formal guidance um, or regulations issued that really helped us to understand what was an unfair or deceptive act in practice. Um, and we've seen something similar with the CFPB. Uh, they've had the power to enforce the abuse of the standards since its inception, uh, but they've really historically targeted their enforcement efforts toward allegedly unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Um, and they've had very, very few um, enforcement actions that solely allege abuse of acts and practices. 
Um, and part of this probably stems from the fact that the FTC really laid the groundwork on unfair and deceptive, and there was uh, sort of a, a universe of case law as well as policy statements to be relied on for those standards, unlike abuse of this. Um, under the leadership of Director Cordray, the CFPB took a very active stance in um, expressly rejecting the position that they should issue additional policy statements or regulations on UDEP. Um, but in December of 2018, Kathleen Cranger took over as director of the CFPB and consistent with statements that had been issued by um, interim director Mulvaney, uh, the CFPB has demonstrated a much greater interest um, in the recent couple of years in issuing rules and policy statements to provide more clarity on legal expectations um, and the the big event for today. In January of 2020, the Bureau issued, issued its first policy statement outlining how it intends to approach abusive actor practices. Um, and we're gonna discuss that in more detail shortly. So just a very quick recap on unfairness and deceptiveness. Um, so in 1964, the FCC issued its first piece of comprehensive guidance with respect to the unfair act or practice standard. And that was later refined in its 1980 policy statement on unfairness, uh, which sets the current unfairness standard, which is applied by both the FTC and the CFPB, um, and was effectively codified in the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, so under the current standard, an act or practice may be deemed unfair if there is a reasonable basis to conclude that the act or practice causes or is likely to cause substantial injury to consumers, which is not reasonably avoidable by consumers, and that substantial injury is not outweighed by a countervailing benefit to consumers or to competition. Um, as you can see, there are a number of practices the CFPB and FTC have determined to be unfair over the years. Um, one sort of prominent example being refusing to release a lien after the final payment has been received. So uh, similar to uh, what happened with unfairness, the deceptiveness standard, the FTC uh, issued a policy statement on in 1983, and that articulated a three-pronged test requiring uh, the following elements for a finding of deceptiveness. Representation, omission, or practice that's likely to mislead the consumer considered from the perspective of the reasonable consumer and which is material, meaning essentially to the consumer's detriment. Um, in 1994, Congress amended the FTC Act to include those three sort of prongs of unfairness um, into the law, and they added the caveat that public policy considerations may not serve as a primary basis for such determination. Um, while that same test is not codified um, in the CFPA, uh, the CFPB has nonetheless adopted that test for deceptiveness, and the CFPB examination manual reflects that um, and provides examples of deceptive acts and practices, uh, again, a number of which are listed on your screen. Um, I will go ahead and turn it over to Sherry now to talk about our main topic, abusiveness. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so as Lauren mentioned, uh, in January, the CFPB issued guidance regarding um, the abusiveness standard. And uh, and as Lauren mentioned, historically, while this abusiveness standard was, was not used broadly until Dodd-Frank Act, there were, the, the, the standard was used in other contexts, as <clears throat> Lauren mentioned, the FDCPA and HOPA. Um, with the FDCPA, uh, there was actually a private right of action for abusive debt collection practices, um, which is notable. Um, and then in and then in 2007, um, there was a discussion about adding the abusiveness standard to the existing UDAP. Um, and the FDIC chair at the time, Sheila Baer, was an early proponent. But the first official suggestion came in the form of a white paper by the Department of Treasury um, in June of 2009. Um, and the and the paper proposed to use the abuse of the standard across all financial sectors. And um, coincidentally, that white paper also proposed a new consumer financial protection agency um, with uh, authority to enforce such standard. But the white paper did not provide any guidance on what abusive means. Um, and, and with the Dodd-Frank Act, um, ab the abusive acts and practices finally, the, the prohibition on abusive acts and practices finally became enforceable. Um, 
And interestingly enough, the earlier version of the Dodd-Frank law included a definition of abusive acts um, that was omitted um, and added a different one, which uh, we'll go into on the next slide. Oh, sorry, on this slide. Um, and that definition, the, the prior definition was that an act was abusive only where the act was reasonably likely to result in a consumer's inability to understand the terms and conditions of a product or service or to protect their own interest in selecting a product or service. Um, and the widespread use of the act um, or practice is reasonably likely to contribute uh, to instability and increase risk in the financial uh, system. So you can see that the definition um, materially changed from the earlier version of the definition to this current version. Um, and interestingly enough, since the CFPB commenced operations in 2011, um, up until fall of last year, they brought 32 actions uh, related to UDAP, but only two of those actions alleged abusiveness um, without also alleging unfairness or deception. Um, and historically, abusiveness claims uh, relied on the, on the same or similar facts um, uh, of those supporting allegations of deceptiveness or unfairness, and, and that called into question the value um, of the abusiveness standard. Um, So in, in, in 2013, the CFPB uh, bulletin uh, on UDAP refrains from adding on to this definition. It just mirrors this definition. Um, the CFPB exam manual also takes this near identical approach. Um, and and as, as uh, Lauren alluded to earlier, the CFPB's lack of substantive guidance as to the meaning of the term abusive was not an oversight, but it appears to be deliberate under the leadership of um, Director Cordray. He had stated that enforcing the abusiveness standard must be done on a fact and circumstances basis and noted that the standard was not something likely to be able to be defined in the abstract. Um, and this approach mirrors that taken with the FTC with regards to the terms unfair and deceptive, um, which allowed for enforcement actions over time to provide kind of the contours of, of those uh, unfair and deceptive acts or practices. So in the spring of 2018, the CFPB issued a request for information and received comments from various trade associations and industry stakeholders, noting that the lack of clarity around the abusiveness standard creates uncertainty, and then it also unnecessarily increases compliance burdens. Um, and then in fall of 2018, the CFPB announced that it was considering whether rulemaking or other activities may be helpful to clarify this definition. And, and the following year in June of 20, uh, June 25th, the CFPB hosted a symposium to hear various perspectives from um, academic experts and practitioners on the Dodd-Frank prohibition on abusive acts or practices. And the consensus from the symposium was that guidance on the meaning of abusiveness uh, would be beneficial. And that brings us to uh, the 2020 statement of policy regarding prohibition on abusive acts or practices. And I've included a high level summary um, of what that policy statement said, uh, which we'll go into in uh, the next slides. But the, the CFPB's intent with applying this, this abusiveness standard is to promote compliance and certainty, as well as to foster the development of abusive law over time. Um, so the CFPB outlined the following approach going forward with respect to abusive acts and practice. It will deem conduct as abusive when the harm to consumers outweighs the benefits. It will generally avoid dual pleading, which is bringing charges for abusive practice against an entity while also bringing charges for unfairness or deception on the same factual circumstances. Um, and the Bureau also noted that it did not intend to seek monetary relief for abusive violations in instances where there is a good faith effort to comply with the abusiveness standard. 
um, except to address consumer injuries caused by that conduct. So let's take this first prong, this abusiveness standard. Let's talk about it a little bit more. Um, so the CFPB noted that it was going to focus its supervisory and enforcement efforts on citing conduct as abusive only if the Bureau determined that the harm to the consumers from the allegedly abusive conduct um, outweighs the benefits to consumers, including any effects on access to creditor, creditors. And this, is, this approach is consistent with the FTC's approach in the context of unfairness and um, deception. So for example, the FTC policy statement on unfairness stated that to justify a finding of unfairness, the injury must satisfy three tests. It must be substantial. It must not be outweighed by any countervailing benefits to consumers or competition that the practice produces. And it must be an injury that consumers themselves could not reasonably have avoided. Um, the FTC also stated a similar policy for deception. Um, so for representations, omissions, or practices to be considered deception, deceptive in violation of the law, such representation, omission, or practice must be material. Um, and in making this determination, it requires an analysis of whether any benefit from the conduct outweighs the harm, um, if in fact any benefit exists. And this, in, this approach, this approach with, with respect to the abusiveness standard, um, is intended to ensure that the Bureau focuses its resources on conduct that harms a consumer, um, and, it, and it intends to promote consistency across uh, matters. Uh, so the next item discussed in the policy statement was identifying acts or practices that violate the abusiveness standard. And the policy statement noted that a single course of conduct may often be the basis um, for alleging unfair or deceptive acts or practices and abusive acts or practices. Um, but the CFPB and the policy statement noted that as a general rule, they were going to avoid alleging an abusive violation that relies on all or nearly all the same facts as an unfairness or deception violation. Instead, they wanted to, they intend to focus on alleging standalone abusiveness violations where appropriate. Um, but in limited circumstances, they did open the door to alleging both an abusive violation or and a related unfairness or deceptive violation where quote it would be help, it would help clarify the scope of the abusiveness standard um, quote in such instances though the bureau said that it was going to uh, it was going to make a commitment to allege the abusiveness violation with sufficient detail to distinguish it from um, the facts uh, that that form the basis for a related unfairness or deception violation. And, and, there, and the hope is that this approach will help them develop a body of law um, that would guide kind of this abusiveness standard. And then in the supervisory context, the Bureau did note that when it seeks information in examinations and investigations, they weren't going to distinguish uh, among the three um, standards, unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices when it requests information um, and when it's considering which claims may be the most appropriate. Um, so identifying acts or practices that violate uh, the abusiveness standard. So the policy statement noted that the Bureau was committed to um, plead uh, the abusiveness claim in a manner designed to demonstrate clearly the nexus between the cited facts and the Bureau's legal analysis of the claim. So it, it appears that the Bureau is trying to um, provide, provide lenders kind of with a roadmap of what would be considered abusive as separate from deceptive and unfairness. And, and the, the Bureau noted that they were gonna apply the standard to both civil litigation and enforcement actions. Um, and they hope that this approach is going to provide greater certainty um, 
regarding the conduct that the CFPB may consider abusive and also, as, as mentioned a few times, trying to develop this body of law that provides a clearer picture of what is considered abusive. Um, the CFPB intends to draft model pleadings and update its UDAP uh, exam manual to provide this greater clarity um, um, as they determine what conduct may be considered abusive and the standards by which uh, such conduct will be evaluated. Um, the CFPB also intends to provide additional clarity uh, in the supervisory highlights. And the overarching goal appears to be increased transparency. Um, another element of the policy statement is the limits on monetary relief in the event of a good faith effort. Uh, the CFPB voiced concerns that uncertainty as to whether they are going to allege unfairness or um, deceptive or abusiveness uh, creates, creates some issues. And so the Bureau intends to allege that conduct violates the abusiveness standard um, and seek relief, uh, seek substantial monetary relief um, in instances when a lender is not acting, quote unquote, in good faith. So they, the CFPB determined that it will not seek certain monetary remedies for abusive acts or practices if the covered person has made a good faith effort to comply with the law based on a reasonable, albeit mistaken, interpretation of the abusiveness standard. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what good faith means. Um, and specifically, the CFPB noted that absent unusual circumstances, they will not seek civil penalties or disgorgement when there's been a good faith effort to comply um, has been demonstrated. And this would be both in the enforcement and supervisory context. Notably, while a good faith effort to comply is relevant to whether the CFPB will seek uh, will seek various monetary ref, uh, remedies, good faith effort is not an affirmative defense to any alleged violation. So even if good faith has been demonstrated, the CFPB will still pursue legal or equitable remedies such as damages or restitution um, to redress identifiable consumer in injury. Um, the CFPB emphasized that it's committed to aggressively pursuing uh, the full range of monetary remedies against bad, bad actors who are not acting in good faith and violating uh, the abusiveness standards, such as those involved in um, fraudulent practices or consumer scams. So let's talk a little bit about what the CFPB um, is looking for when it says good faith effort. So the CFPB will consider their CFPB Bulletin 2013-06, which was actually updated in March of 2020. Um, and they're gonna focus on the following factors, self-policing, self-reporting, remediation, and cooperation with um, a Bureau's enforcement investigation. So with self-policing, the CFPB is going to be asking about the nature of the violation, um, how did it arise? Was the conduct pervasive or was it an isolated act? How long did the conduct last? Was the conduct significant to the party's profitability or business model? How was the violation or potential violation detected and who uncovered it? What compliance procedures or self-policing mechanisms were in place to prevent, identify, or limit the conduct that occurred and to preserve relevant information? Um, were were the self were the party self policing mechanisms particularly effective or not, uh, noteworthy? Uh, the CFPB is also going to look at self -re reporting. They take the view that prompt self reporting of serious violations um, shows uh, evidence of a party's commitment to responsibly address the conduct at issue. And the CFPB has stated that they will put special emphasis on this category. Um, in its evaluation of a party's overall conduct. So with respect to self-reporting, some of the questions the CFPB will ask is, well, did the party completely and effectively 
disclose the existence of the conduct uh, to the Bureau? Did consumers receive appropriate information related to the violation? Um, was the reporting done promptly to the Bureau? And if there was a delay, what was the reason for the delay? Um, did the did the party preserve all the relevant information uh, for the Bureau to conduct its investigation? Uh, the third factor the Bureau is gonna look at is remediation. And uh, the CFPB's remediation priorities include obtaining full redress for those injured by the violations and ensuring that the party who violated the law implements measures designed to prevent the violation from um, reoccurring. Um, as well as making sure that the party's future conduct has changed to protect and benefit the consumer. And the CFPB noted that remediation may be viewed positively even when the party believes that it may have identified a potential uh, rather than an actual violation. And then the last factor outlined in the CFPB bulletin um, from 2013 is cooperation. And cooperation really focuses on the quality of the party's interactions with the Bureau um, after the CFPB has become aware of a potential or actual violation. Um, and in order to receive credit for cooperation, the Bureau noted that the party must take substantial and material steps above and beyond what the law requires in its interactions with the Bureau. And just simply meeting these obligations will not be rewarded by any special consideration. Um, the CFPB also will look at the reasonable, reasonableness of the covered person's interpretation based on a number of factors. So they're going to look at um, how reasonable was your argument that your conduct was not abusive based on the statutory definition of abusiveness, um, this policy statement, judicial precedent, supervisory guidance, um, administrative decisions, rulemaking, and um, I want to flag this one, enforce past enforcement actions, uh, because as we know from uh, other laws, the CFPB does include guidance in enforcement actions for um, how certain conduct, for, for certain conduct. I'll turn it to uh, Lauren to chat a little bit about the abusiveness enforcement environment. Wonderful, thanks. Um, so we haven't really seen uh, the impact of the policy statement on enforcement just yet. Um, allegations of unfairness and deceptiveness really remain much, much more common than allegations of abusiveness um, in bureau enforcement actions. And there have only been a couple of actions brought alleging abusive acts and practices since the policy statement was issued. Um, and in each of those matters, allegations of unfair or deceptive conduct were also included. So we're not yet seeing that sort of commitment to looking at abusiveness in isolation and as its own standard yet. Um, but given how young the policy statement is, I don't think that's particularly surprising. Um, so the sort of the main things we've seen in the abusiveness space at the enforcement level since the policy statement um, would be the following. So in March, the CFPB filed a lawsuit alleging that a regional bank committed unfair and abusive acts or practices um, by engaging in various activities without consumers' knowledge or consent. Um, and those included opening deposit and credit card accounts in consumers' names, transferring funds from consumers' existing accounts to new improperly opened accounts, enrolling consumers in unauthorized online banking services, and activating unauthorized lines of credit on consumers' accounts. Um, notably, the Bureau is seeking a civil money penalty in the case and did not allege any facts uh, or even talk about good faith, which, as Sherry just went through, if alleged, uh, could have reduced the likelihood of the Bureau seeking a civil money penalty. Um, I don't think, you know, given uh, what the, the conduct the Bureau alleged, that that's particularly surprising, but it will be interesting going forward to see uh, if the Bureau really addresses good faith uh, affirmatively in enforcement actions or only addresses it uh, where they're uh, not seeking a civil money penalty. Um, and then in August of 2020, the CFPB entered into a consent order with a national bank settling allegations that the bank engaged in deceptive acts or practices 
business by making misleading representations to consumers about optional overdraft services. Um, and they also allege abusive acts of practices by materially interfering with consumers' ability to understand the terms and conditions of the optional overdraft service product. So again, we see that there were deceptive and abusive claims together, although in this particular instance, uh, the Bureau did allege sort of distinct facts for each of those claims, uh, which is a bit more in line with what they propose under the policy statement. Um, the final thing is that in July of this year, the Bureau announced a proposed settlement with a debt relief company to resolve allegations of abusive telemarketing practices. Um, notably, this was under the Telemarketing Act and Telemarketing Sales Rule uh, and their abusiveness provisions, uh, not under the CFPA provisions. Um, and similar allegations were brought against a credit repair organization alleged to be violating telemarketing laws in May. Um, so I think going forward, we're probably going to see um, more abusiveness, but certainly since the policy statement was issued, we haven't really seen it make a big splash yet. And I'll turn it back to Sherry to talk a little more about what we might expect in the future. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so how does this policy impact things going forward? Um, interestingly enough, the CFPB appears to minimize the guidance somewhat, likely in an effort to not trigger additional APA or regulatory requirements. So, for example, the policy street statement is framed as information regarding the Bureau's general plans to exercise its discretion that does not impose any legal requirements on external parties that could be enforceable in any administrative or civil proceeding. And this position is co consistent with the CF CFPB's position um, that the policy statement should be exe is exempt from um, the APA notice and comment rulemaking requirements. Um, and they specifically noted in the policy statement that the policy statement is a general statement of policy, which is exempt from uh, the APA requirements. Um, they also noted that the policy statement is not a quote unquote statement of policy as the term is specifically used in RESPA, um, which could subject the policy statement to additional regulatory requirements. Um, the Bureau also framed the policy statement as to not impose any new or revise any existing record keeping, reporting, or disclosure requirements that would have required OMB approval. So where the CFPB has previously asserted an abusive claim, abusiveness claim and an enforcement action that is pending in court, um, the, the CFPB um, will determine how to proceed in light of this policy statement um, in its discretion based on the facts and circumstances of a particular case. So what comes next? So the CFPB left open the possibility of engaging in future rulemaking um, to further define uh, the abusiveness standard, though it has not made any overtures um, as to that yet. But the Bureau did signal that it was going to draft model uh, pleading for the abusiveness allegations. It was going to update the UDAP exam manual. Um, it was also going to provide clarity uh, with respect to the abusiveness standard in future ed editions of supervisory highlights, which has not been the case historically. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the Bureau did that, uh, does that. And um, as, as Lauren noted, we're likely to see an increase in the number of enforcement actions solely alleging abusiveness violations and a decrease um, in enforcement actions alleging unfair, deceptive, and abusive acts or practices unless the fact patterns um, for such allegations materially differ. Um, so what should lenders do with this new guidance? What are some best practices? Uh, number one, monitor CFPB guidance. Uh, monitor enforcement actions, supervisory highlights, UDAP examinations. Um, also monitor the FTC guidance. Uh, and, and this is particularly important because the CFPB has indicated that it was going to um, update its materials with additional guidance. Um, internally, uh, companies should be looking at their policies and procedures to take into account the good faith standard 
um, that the CFPB outlined if it has not done so already. Um, this will be particularly important um, to show kind of, to prove to the DBO, uh, sorry, the department, sorry, I am also in DBO world, um, to indicate to the Bureau that you are, you are providing, um, uh, you are acting in good faith uh, with respect to uh, your activities. Um, another thing to be doing is tracking complaints, um, both internally and those submitted to the CFPB, which is public. Um, when you receive a complaint, and try to resolve it as quickly as possible. This may be the time to um, involve outside counsel to investigate the complaint and the root of the complaint. Um, because complaints have more implications than just uh, regulatory implications. It also has reputational risk. Um, and, and these types of best practices, I think, will help uh, a company show that they are acting in good faith um, and that they are attempting to uh, be cognizant of the various standards uh, to ensure uh, a, a a better customer experience. And with that, if anyone has any questions, I'll turn it over to Susan. Great, thank you both. Uh, very much appreciate that information. Um, good, uh, good information to be uh, to be having, and, and also kind of matches what uh, what Michael was um, talking about on the latest litigation update. Um, if you have a question for either Sherry or Lauren, you can type your question into the questions dialog box, which is on, um, on the, um, the right-hand panel of your menu bar there. We are also recording this webinar, so if you have, um, you will you know, be able to view this again or share it with um, some of those who might be in your offices. And... Okay, we are waiting for some questions to come in. Go ahead and uh, type those into the questions dialog box. Um, I will remind you that I've shared uh, in the chat function the link to this year's Legal Issues and Regulatory Compliance Conference. That link will have information on registration as well as um, sponsorship opportunities if you're interested in participating in that way. So I does not look like we have questions coming in. Um, so uh, thank you again for your presentation, uh, Sherry and Lauren, we appreciate it. Uh, just a reminder, as I'd mentioned at the top of the webinar, we do have one more webinar this year. Uh, it will be on um, Thursday, October 22nd. And uh, our presenters will be from MQMR talking about top policies and procedures often missed or messed up and how to get them right. So uh, mark your calendar to join us for our next webinar. That's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us and hopefully we'll see you on the 22nd.